Hello class, Dr. Mike Burford here. Um, I want to talk with you a little bit about substance related and addictive disorders. Um, I doubt that there's anyone among you who in some way has not been uh, either directly or indirectly impacted by um, substance abuse, whether it be in your family or friends or perhaps your uh, work environment. Um, and certainly as communities, we're all impacted by um, substance abuse. Um, I'm thinking of drunk drivers um, immediately is what comes to mind with that, but um, certainly other things as well. All right, so substance abuse, I'm sorry, substance related and addictive disorders. Um, that's the topic for today's uh, discussion. Um, of course, we'll be using the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders 5th Edition for our information today. Again, that's what you'll be using as clinicians, and so um, I have taken information from there uh, to present to you, and uh, of course I'll be adding some thoughts and all that as we go along. Okay, so the essential feature of substance use disorder um, is a cluster of cognitive, behavioral, and physiological symptoms indicative of a person continuing to use a substance despite significant substance use related problems. Um, and I'll give you an example. I remember many years ago, um, I was working with a group of people and um, we were actually learning about substance abuse. And I had a guest speaker come in, someone that was um, addicted to alcohol and was successfully in treatment for that and had been sober for um, quite some time, but as part of his sobriety, he made it a point to go around and share what he knew about um, alcoholism and, um, and his experience and, and hopes that he would help others. And so in his talk, he made mention of an example where, where he um, wrecked his car four or five different times uh, while under the influence of alcohol. And when he, he gave the, the details of the first crash, um, I was sitting there and I was thinking, well, that's terrible. That sounds like just a really bad crash. And, and wow, you know, it's a, it's a miracle that he walked away and, and so forth. And then he started talking about the second crash and then the third crash. And I started scratching my head and I thought, well, now, why in the world would someone continue that behavior after having that first horrendous crash that almost killed him. Um, obviously it was quite painful and, and traumatic and, and um, caused all kinds of problems and took a long time to get over. And I thought, well, why in the world would he, would he go back and, and do that again and again and again until finally one day um, he stopped. And so after the, after the meeting, I asked him that and um, of the group, I asked him, and, and he says, well, you know, the funny thing is that during the whole thing, I never made the connection between me drinking and having those crashes. And I looked at him like he'd lost his mind, and I thought, well, what do you mean you didn't make the current connection? He said, no, it just never popped in my head. He said, I was so busy, wrapped up in, in drinking and, and um, the drinking lifestyle and, and denial and all of that, that it never occurred to me that... Um, that I was um, having the wrecks because of, of the alcohol. Um, and so to me, that was very informative because it, it helped me begin to understand how um, somebody's mind can work or not work, I guess, depends on how you want to look at it, um, when they are actively using, actively and habitually using substances. In the DSM-5, there's some significant changes, um, as you hopefully know, um, from your readings and whatnot, but um, one of the biggest changes has to do with addictions. And so the term addiction is no longer used in the DSM and it's replaced due to its reported uncertain definition um, and potential negative connotation. Now, I remember um, when I used to use the DSM-4-TR, for diagnostics, um, uh, I remembered I had to be very careful in um, making the diagnosis of, um, of addiction um, as opposed to substance use. So 
now that um, um, that term addiction is not there, and so um, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'm, I'm not sure that that I agree that um, that uh, substance use disorder is better uh, as a term. And and um, of course, the argument that's made is that it describes the continuum of substance abuse. Well, okay, maybe I may I may buy that. I need to think some more about that. I'm not sure that I. I uh, completely agree with, with that change. One thing that I certainly don't like um, about the new DSM-5 and, and the addictions, or well, I guess I should say the, the substance abuse section, um, is that they've taken out um, something called uh, polysubstance abuse or polysubstance addiction. Um, well, and polysubstance addiction. They had them both in there, if I remember correctly. and. Um, I found that to be quite a useful, um, quite a useful diagnostic, um, uh, well, quite a useful diagnosis because basically it meant that a person has several substances they abuse and that there's not one that's predominant. And I had several people over the years that fit that criteria. Um, and it was more a matter of, well, you know, they'll use whatever they can, can find to use. Uh, but that's no longer in the DSM-5, and, and now you have to specify each and every, um, every each and every disorder. Uh, well, and I guess that can be useful too. I mean, depending on um, what the disorders are, and um, it may be that um, different treatments exist for certain things. Um, so you have to tailor, which I, I kind of buy that. So, anyways, those are my thoughts on those changes. So I want to talk about neurological changes for um, just a few minutes here. An important characteristic of substance use disorders is an underlying change in brain circuits that may persist, especially in cases of severe substance abuse. Now, traditionally there have been two camps when it comes to substance abuse. There is the camp that says um, substance um, use and abuse is um, is a disease. It's it's um, there's a disease model and that uh, they said that once a person was addicted, they're always addicted um, regardless, even if they're not currently and actively using the substance, physiologically, they're still addicted. And, um, and then there was the other camp that would say, well, you know what, we don't necessarily believe that. Um, we believe that although a person may have been addicted, um, later on, they would be able, uh, at least some people would be able to um, engage in the, in the substance on a recreational basis and to be able to keep it in check. Um, and I used to be in that camp because I'm someone that believes in um, um, free will and, and to a certain degree personal responsibility and all that. And, and I thought, well, okay. Um, it's all about managing and, and um, knowing oneself and having a certain amount of control and being plugged into the right systems and all that. Um, turns out I was wrong. Turns out I was wrong about that. We have um, new scientific evidence, uh, new breakthroughs and um, neuroscience that show us that yes, indeed, um, addiction is a disease. And, and I don't mean a disease in, in terms of, ooh, something's dirty, but I mean a disease in terms of it's something that doesn't have a cure and that the best we can hope to do is to manage it. Um, so um, neuroscience is showing us that with addictions, that's absolutely true. It is a disease. And that, if you think about it, helps explain why someone can um, go from drinking a case of beer today uh, to um, being abstinent of beer um, um, for a number of years and then um, go to drink a beer and next thing you know they're right back up to a case a day. So basically what's happened with that person is that their body has changed and that they're able to um, process that beer more efficiently and that um, um, the way their brain reacts to, to the alcohol is different um, than, than it was prior to that person using alcohol to begin with. 
And so, and so they're able to um, quickly resume right where they left off. So it all kind of makes sense if you think about it. Now, on your D2L side, I've got several, um, if I recall correctly, I've got several videos that I've put on there. I do hope that you take a few minutes to um, look at those. And in fact, um, several of those videos from that particular site um, are very helpful and useful. And I hope that, that you look at all of them um, if you're interested in, um, in addictions. Uh, well, I guess I should more properly say substance use disorders. You know, that's the, there, there's a good thing about being a person that's been, a, been around for a while and been a clinician for a while. You know, that's, experience is very valuable, especially if it's good experience. Um, but sometimes when there's new changes that come around like the DSM, sometimes it's a bit difficult to, to um, change one's um, lingo a little. So um, one of the hazards of having been around for a while. You know, the other thing is, speaking of that, this is a bit unrelated. I have often had um, somebody come to me and said, well, I've been a therapist for... 20 years, uh, I'll be sitting there thinking, well, okay, but that doesn't mean you've been a good one for 20 years. It could mean that you've had 20 years of tomfoolery or something, you know, who knows? <laughs> so keep that in mind as well. The important thing is, is that you educate yourself really well um, and, and readings and, and that you make time to talk with people that are experienced, um, you know, some of them will probably be good and some of them probably not so good. But if you're a, a, a true student of, of all things clinical, then um, fairly quickly you should be able to become very competent and um, be able to hold your own even with a person that tells you they've been doing it for 20 years. So, anyways. Now, let me qualify what I just said. That doesn't mean that, that you know, if you read the DSM and, you know, maybe have a year's worth of experience or something that, that you're, um, you know, the greatest thing that ever was. That's not true either. I mean, we all have room for learning and growth and, you know, I don't want you to get too haughty and, and think that you're, um, that you don't have room for growth. We all do. But um, just keep in mind that Again, you can be very competent if you um, are a true student of, of all things clinical and, and um, practice and, and do lots of reading of um, articles on the topics and know the DSM pretty well. Um, pick a couple of treatment interventions that you want to focus on and learn all you can about them and talk with other people that are doing them and all that and you should be fine. Um, for diagnosis, um, diagnosis is based on pathological patterns of behavior re related to the substance abuse. Um, and we think about impaired control. Um, and so with impaired control, increased use over a longer time than intended is common. Um, desire and sometimes attempts to reduce use um, are common. Um, lots of times I have people with substance uh, use disorders that come in and, and they'll tell me that they've had several failed attempts at managing their disorder. Um, people with this disorder, one of these disorders, spend excessive time involved in um, activity related to the substance use. Um, things like finding the drug and then you actually using the drug and being high um, and then uh, withdrawals. Um, all those are ways that time is spent. Um, and then cravings for, for the drug, uh, that's part of impaired control. Um, social impairment um, can exist, um, and that's failure to fulfill obligations, social obligations, whether it's at work or maybe school or um, maybe in the home as a, as a husband or wife or as a parent. Um, in one of the earlier videos, I was talking about kids that are in congregate care, group homes and foster homes and all that. And I can tell you that a large uh, percentage of those kids um, have parents that are um, 
on the substance abuse continuum and um, oftentimes on the severe end of that. Um, and so obviously they're fulfill, or failing to fulfill their obligations as parents to those kids. And that's a tragic, tragic thing that those kids suffer that way. Um, it's not their fault at all. So, um, all right, continued use despite social engagement failures and reduction or cessation of important social activities. So for instance, I'm thinking of this person that I knew um, several years ago and um, she uh, was to the point to where she couldn't function very well socially and actually her, the, the majority of her life was spent in her apartment. Um, and she would venture out if she had to, to go to the grocery store or she'd venture out to go get um, her um, drink of choice or cigarettes or something of that nature. Um, but very rarely would she go out, um, and especially hardly ever for social events. And when she did, um, she was uh, very anxious to get back home um, so that she, I would assume, can resume drinking. Um, now, risky use um, is another pattern of behavior that's related to substance use. Um, continued use despite hazards, that's like the guy that I just told you about that was driving and um, wasn't able to make the connection between the alcohol and the car crashes. Um, and continued use despite knowledge of hazards. Um, I know someone uh, in my personal life like that that knows that he has an addiction to alcohol and knows that he does things that cause him uh, to be in jail, but um, despite knowledge of all that, um, would continue to, um, to drink, um, at least uh, sporadically. He's what we call a binge drinker, by the way. Anyways, um, pharmacological criteria, um, there's tolerance usually that's um, built up with substance use, you've probably heard of that. And then of course, withdrawals. I mean, some substances, depending on what they are, can cause some really nasty withdrawal si uh, symptoms if, um, if that uh, drug of choice isn't continued. Um, for instance, uh, with opioids, um, I understand that the withdrawal is very uh, difficult, very hard, very um, painful, if you will, uh, and um, very unpleasant. People with opiate uh, withdrawal, gets, uh, they get pretty sick from what I understand. Um, and, and some uh, withdrawals are um, quite dangerous. Some of them can um, uh, actually cause death if not uh, managed properly. Um, alcohol is one of those cases. Okay, diagnostic features common to substance use disorders. Um, there's a clinically significant symptomatic presentation of a relevant mental disorder. Uh, there's historical, physical examination or laboratory evidence of a disorder developed within one month of substance intoxication, um, withdrawal or taking medication. Um, so the disorder develops within a month of substance intoxication, withdrawal, or taking medication. Um, the involved substance is capable of producing the mental disorder. Um, the disorder is not better explained by an independent mental disorder. The disorder doesn't, doesn't occur exclusively during course of delirium. And the disorder, of course, causes significant impairment in important areas of functioning, uh, such as social, occupational, and educational areas. I want to talk with you just real briefly about comorbidity. Um, it's in my experience, and, and I would imagine that most clinicians that have been in practice for a while would agree, that um, substance abuse, or I guess more properly I should say substance use, is commonly seen in people with other severe and pervasive mental disorders. Um, and the substance use is often referred to as self-medication and is used as a means by the person uh, using the substance to manage symptoms of the primary mental disorder. Um, oftentimes I'll see people that have bipolar disorder that are 
currently or have um, recently used marijuana, for instance, to help um, help um, calm and regulate their mood. Um, a lot of times people with schizophrenia uh, will um, use marijuana to help um, calm the voices that they hear if they have auditory hallucinations. Um, a lot of times um, people with schizophrenia will turn to alcohol. Um, so it's not uncommon to see people that have a, a severe and pervasive mental disorder um, also have substance use. Um, and of course then as a clinician, as a diagnostician, um, part of your job will be to understand if um, the person was using substances and then had psychotic features or then had mood swings or then had some of the other problems or if um, maybe they had those things first and then they began using substance um, and that type of thing. But one of the things that you would certainly want to do is, is um, in, in treatment is address um, the substance use. I can also tell you that um, unless I'm specifically doing um, substance use intervention, um, oftentimes it's really hard to work with someone and make progress um, who is actively addicted to um, a substance. Now, for instance, if somebody comes in to me and says, uh, well, okay, I'm here for depression and I'd like to get rid of my depression. And I'd say, oh, that's great. And they'd say, and, and my depression is causing me to have significant problems in my family. My wife and I don't get along. And I'm thinking, well, okay, we need to address some family related issues as well. And well, it turns out if the person's um, drinking a six pack of, of beer a day, um, well, that can have a huge impact on um, the person's ability to get, a, get along at home and, and, um, and depression and the whole nine yards. And so I would be amiss to um, not address the substance abuse um, as well as the other things. Um, and in fact, like I said, I've, I've found very limited success and working with people that have other disorders like depression and anxiety um, that are actively using substances. So I even remember one guy that came in drunk. He was, uh, and I realized he was drunk after about the first five minutes or so. And so I terminated the session. I didn't see a point in continuing uh, with him while he's intoxicated. Um, and then we addressed that at a later time when he was sober. Okay, so for the subtypes of substance related disorders, um, there are several things, and, and you'll see this when you get in the DSM-5 and you're looking at the disorders. And what you'll see is you'll have whatever particular disorder, whether it be alcohol or marijuana or opiates or, or what have you, inhalants, whatever they are, and it'll say um, X use disorder, and then um, X, whatever it is, intoxication, X withdrawal, other X-induced disorders or unspecified X-related disorders, and that's usually the progression there, and that's the way the new DSM-5 is, um, is laid out. And so here I have a list of, of the various substance-related and addictive disorders, and what you'll see here is that um, these are um, laid out by section, and um, any one of these particular sections may have um, a number of different specific drugs under them. Uh, for instance, opioids, um, if I recall correctly, has several and, and the same thing for um, some of the others, so like the stimulants and whatnot. Um, so anyways, we have alcohol, caffeine, cannabis, hallucinogen, inhalants, um, opioid sedatives, um, hypnotics and anxiolytics, um, stimulants, tobacco, and then others. Um, and then of course, non-substance related disorders such as gambling. Um, I've had a few people over the years that had a gambling problem, not many, but a few. Um, so that's, in my experience, pretty rare that somebody would come in with that. I wanna tell you that um, as far as treatments go, probably opioids are the most difficult that I've experienced in terms of 
a person being abstinent and staying abstinent. Um, the other thing I'll say is is that at least there for a while, um, when I work with kids a lot, I don't work with kids a whole lot anymore. I've got a few on my caseload, but when I was in private practice, I had quite a bit of kids, quite a few kids on my caseload, and and um, inhalant uh, use was becoming pretty big. Um, it seems like there was a at least in Knoxville anyway, where I was practicing, there was a quite a quite a big increase in kids that would come in that had abused inhalants, which I don't know how much you know about that, but that can be pretty dangerous um, from a neurological perspective. Um, can do some, some pretty significant damage from what I understand. Um, as far as treatment, um, several options um, exist, and a lot of that depends on how severe someone's substance use is. Um, I'll start with medical detoxification, um, and that's um, uh, for people that are, um, well, I'll just say what it is, seriously addicted, um, and uh, without medical intervention um, would be at risk of um, serious physical problems, including death. Um, I'm thinking of delirium tremens here. Uh, you may have heard of that. People having DTs, for instance, when they stop using alcohol, if they have a long and, and severe history of alcohol use. Um, and so what happens is they get checked into a medical unit and uh, for a couple of days they're monitored pretty heavily and they're given um, various medications to help their body adjust to the absence of alcohol. Um, I'm also, um, along the lines of inpatient care, um, I'm thinking of some of the inpatient treatment facilities that can last um, from a week up to several months. Um, in Knoxville, I was associated with um, a place like that for a while. It was a really good place and um, um, they had levels of care. Um, and when a person first came in, uh, it was very intensive treatment. And then gradually, as the person became more stable over time, um, the treatment uh, became less and less intense um, to the point of the person living for um, six months in a halfway house um, so that they're still receiving some support, but they're also operating um, in the social environment, actually in their environment, in their community. Um, You know, I've heard cases where people would be leaving the um, treatment center after being discharged and stop on the way home and get their drug of choice, which that certainly happens on occasion. Um, I think what it really comes down to is if the person wants to stop. You know, that's the that's the key. If if they really want to stop, and if they support. Uh, surround themselves with support, social support that will help them um, help them be successful. So for instance, if a, if a person wants to stop and they say, well, okay, I'm gonna to go to Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous, I'm gonna do that every day or two or three times a day or what have you, um, and, uh, or not two or three times a day, but every day and or two or three times a week or whatever it is they need to do, um, then obviously they're reaching out for the support and they're trying to make a really good effort at, at getting away from the substance use. Um, these are people that will um, stay away from old friends that use, old environments that use. I mean, you know, it doesn't make sense for somebody that knows that they have a problem with alcohol to go into the bar thinking, well, I can go in and shoot a couple of rounds of pool. Well, no, best thing to do is just stay out of the bar. You know, why tempt yourself? Um, and so it's learning things like that. The other thing I want to tell you is that um, AA is um, very helpful. Um, it's shown to be probably the most effective um, intervention, uh, at least for alcohol use and uh, NA for, for or narcotics use um, than any other intervention I can think of. Um, you know, I once had a, a person that was a friend of mine, and um, we, um, I would ask him, um, I'd say, well, hey, man, what are, you, what are you doing after work? Or he'd ask me, what are you doing after work? And 
and um, so we would each say what we're doing and with him it was always his evening always included stopping by an AA meeting and so one day I said to him this was many years ago I probably shouldn't have said this to him but I did back then back in those days it's hard telling what I would have said to somebody but um, I said to him I said well it seems to me like your AA meetings are an addiction in and of themselves and he looked at me and he grinned and he said you know what you're absolutely right but you know the difference and I said well I couldn't tell you what's the difference and he says well when I'm drinking he, he said that addiction um, gets me thrown in jail because apparently he would drink and drive and or drink and start fights um, and he said so that addiction got me thrown in jail the AA addiction keeps me sober allows me to maintain employment um, and keeps me out of jail can't argue with that so you know also I want to mention Al-Anon that's for people um, who are family members and friends of a person that's um, a heavy substance user or in the old vernacular addicted um, uh, which you know that term apparently is not very politically correct to use anymore but um, um, so Al-Anon can be helpful for those folks because um, it'll give them a place to go and talk about their experiences and to know that other people are going through like things, similar things, um, and that um, um, that there's support and all that. And so they go for those meetings and they can be quite beneficial. It's a good way to disseminate information and knowledge. Um, supportive psychotherapy is um, useful sometimes, as is medication such as an abuse. Um, a person that takes an abuse and then tries to drink alcohol gets pretty sick from what I understand it's not a fun experience okay class so that's a um, an overview of substance um, use and abuse and um, if you're interested in substance use and abuse I, I hope that again you get into the databases to um, social science databases here available available to you here at ETSU and um, and avail yourself to that information as well all right, well, have a great week. Study hard.